of our financial assets. Part of giving is spiritual and part of it in the church is um, just what we got to do to pay the bills of the church. We have to pay the mortgage. We have to pay to keep the building up. We got to pay for this, all this acreage here. Um, we need to support our missionaries and the work they're doing around the world. And God has given us this amazing ministry that we're doing and we need to support it and be responsible for that. But giving is also a form of worship. Um, John 3.16, God gave his son. He is a giver, okay? And he gave because he loves us. God's heart is giving. His heart is love. And as we give and worship, we show our love for Jesus through giving. And we need to trust him with our lives. We need to trust him with our finances. And then as we give, we receive a freedom from him to let go of our possessions, to open up our hands, and let him have what he's already given us in the first place. Um, When I was in college, I was very involved in my church's youth group. I was a youth leader. And I was there all the time. I loved it. Um, and as I was doing that, I was finishing up college and I started dating this guy over here and on our first date, we went to this balloon festival and, uh, as we were leaving, (laughs) it was pretty, it was romantic, whatever. Um, (laughs) so we're leaving, we're in the parking garage and, there was, I looked down and I found a hundred dollar bill on the ground (laughs) and, um, there was no one around. We looked around, we're like, Oh my gosh. And I picked it up and I was like making plans. (laughs) I was in college. I didn't have a lot of money. I'm like, this is awesome. And so, you know, we, the next, that was Saturday, Sunday morning comes and we had a missionary in the church. And of course my heart is for missions. I love missions. And uh, you know, I just felt the Lord stirring my heart to give that $100 bill to that missionary. And at first I'm like, oh, I don't really want to. I will be honest. But I did. I put it in the thing. And as I did that, man, like just joy. And I, you feel a part of something when you give to it. Like I just felt ownership for that. And I was really helping spread the gospel through this missionary of what I gave. And, you know, Matthew 6, 21, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. Okay? My heart was for missions, and that's exactly where that money went. And guess what happened? That evening when we had um, our, our youth service, my youth pastor comes to me. He says, Becca, I just want to thank you for all your work. You've been so great. He hands me an envelope. Inside is a check for 100 bucks. So it's like God knew my heart. Now, that is not, that's not the reason we give, but like I said earlier, when our hands are open to give, they're open to also receive, and that is our God. He wants to give to us as we give to him. So open your hands to give to God. I challenge you to give to God, and just watch and see as you give, you're going to feel an ownership of the ministries in this church. You're going to feel more a part. You're going to feel an ownership of it. And God will strengthen that in your heart as you give to him. Nicole Engel is going to come now. And, uh, Nicole is special in this, is that she has been the children's director here at New Harvest for eight years. Um, And David's coming too. And uh, (laughs) Nicole's been the children's minister here for eight years. 
and only the last maybe 18 months she's ever been paid for this particular service. She's done it out of the joy of her heart and out of a self-sacrificial nature. And um, um, so we're so blessed to have Nicole. Will you give her a hand as she tells us why we disciple our children? All right. Oh, you got to turn Alfred around. This is Alfred. He's going to help us today. All right. Yeah, Alfred's really cool. Okay. So why do we do children's ministry? Because they say the funniest things, and parents, I found out a lot of things. I'm just telling you. No. (laughs) So if anybody's been down the children's wing, they'll notice a big scripture that's written on the wall. Um, And it's Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6 and 7. But this morning, I'm going to read a few more verses. We're going to back up um, to verse 4. And I'm going to read this to you this morning. It says, listen, O Israel. Kids, are you listening? You ever say that to your kids? Listen. I'm I'm talking. Listen, the, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again and again to your children and again and again because they didn't get it the first hundred times. I can guarantee it. It might be the hundred first, but you got to keep repeating it to them. That's the mama version of Deuteronomy 7. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders because they still didn't get it the hundred and five times. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So children's ministry isn't just Sunday mornings. It isn't just Wednesday nights. It's a lifestyle, okay? You completely take everything that you have and you invest it into these children. You have to take every opportunity that you get to teach our kids that there's only one true God and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, okay? Because many of us know in a moment, any one of these kids could be gone just like that. And I don't want the responsibility of knowing that I didn't do everything that I could to speak to these kids if the next Sunday they weren't there. I don't want that on my shoulders. I don't want that when I stand before God and he says, why didn't you say something to this kid? Why didn't you give him the opportunity to receive Christ? I don't want that. I'm going to take every opportunity that I have, whether it's in a church setting, whether we're in a church event, or we're in Kroger getting groceries, I'm going to take every opportunity to show my kids how to be the love of Christ, how to show that, how to be the hands and feet of Christ. We need to be very deliberate, always thinking about how can I pass these truths onto these kids, because we all know we live in a crazy world and they get bombarded with everything that the enemy can all the lies the enemy because he's the father of lies he's got some really good tricks okay and we have to be tricky we have to make sure that these kids are founded and they have this foundation in in christ this is why we get the kids involved in outreaches this is why we have them help in vents where they're cleaning up they're setting up they're going to be the future leaders of this church they're not the future church because they're the church now Okay. Don't think they're some far off generation. They're going to they're gonna be the church. They're the church now, and they're going to be the future leaders of this church. This gives them the foundation to, um, to grow strong, uh, men and women of Christ. And just a little crazy statistics, by the age of nine, okay, any nine-year-olds in here? Anybody older than nine in this room? Raise your hand. If you're older than nine. Okay, by the age of nine, the basic moral foundation of your life has already been formed by nine. That's insane. A nine-year-old, they're kind of irrational, so if you've ever ever argued with a nine-year-old. By 14, a person has formed the majority of their beliefs about the nature of God, about the existence of God, the reliability of the Bible, the holiness of Jesus, and the importance of the Holy Spirit. Between the ages of 4 and 14, a person is most open to the gospel. That's 10 years. Anybody know how fast 10 years flies? Yes. Just last week I was getting married, and that was, you know, over 10 years ago, and it flies by, okay? 
we have we don't have that long to teach these kids and the older they get the harder it is to get them they're less open to that because we get harder headed as we get older anybody stuck in their ways yeah so we have this gap and of this age group from 4 to 14 there's 50 million kids in america that fall in this age range and of these kids 80 percent never go to church that is that equals to 40 million kids in this country that don't go to church that's not a third world country that's not in some village in india or some village in south america that's kids in america that's kids in this community that have never gone to church and that is un, unacceptable it's unacceptable that these kids do not know the love of jesus we have only 10 years to when these kids are most influential we have to be deliberate to build that strong foundation in these kids or the enemy is going to easily sway them with the lies now albert is going to help me and albert's friend david this is albert and do what alfred whatever alfred okay and he's an eight-year-old kid and Life just threw him a curveball, and his parents got divorced. So I want you to blow. Okay, well, that'll work. Alfred gets knocked down because he has no foundation. Okay? Set him up again. Alfred gets bullied at school, and he has no self-confidence, and he wants to kill himself. Because he has no foundation, he's knocked down easily. Now... We're going to put his foundation in Christ. We're going to get him firmly footed with the knowledge that Jesus loves him. Jesus died for him. And there's hope and there's love found in Jesus. Now, let's see. The storms of life are raging and his parents are arguing all the time. Um... The bullies are never, ever stopping. They're not letting up, but he's not falling down because he's founded in Jesus. This is why we do children's ministry. That was a great job. Great job. Jennifer Payton's going to come and tell us why we disciple our youth. Jennifer Payton is also a board member of this church, and uh, you can, biblically it would be a deacon. And uh, uh, she is the primary discipler, along with my wife, of our youth ministry here at New Harvest. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question, why we disciple our youth, but I'm going to add a little bit more specific. Why we disciple our youth in community? Because we do youth differently here. It's ages... Well, it's all ages. It goes all the way up. So, um, first I'm going to tell you a story about India. (laughs) Uh, Most of you guys know I broke my elbow in India on the third day that we were there, and we were there for two weeks. But it ended up being a really great thing because we got to stay where um, there was an orphanage there with 25 boys. So if we had, if I had not broken my elbow, we would have been out doing things, which would have been great, but we would not have built relationships with anyone. So we got to stay with the boys, and we got to do devotions with them, and which was, we would have got to do that, but it would have been like two or three times. But the whole second week, we had to do devotions with them every single day. And how they do devotions is they, the same way we do youth. So it was... Um, The oldest boy tells them, you know, everybody sit down. I don't know what he says because it's in Hindi. But um, I'm guessing he says everybody sit down because they all sit down. And and then they start praying, and um, then they worship. The oldest kids lead worship, and they, while they're leading worship, they teach the younger boys how to lead worship. And then the oldest kid, after they're finished with worship, says something probably be quiet I'm going to teach or something like that (laughs) and they do a devotion and the older boys disciple the younger boys and they've been doing this for lots of years like pretty much since they started 
And what happens is those boys, they, once they graduate high school, they go to college, but then they come back, a lot of them come back, and they teach and invest in the boys growing up in the home. And they disciple the younger boys, and they disciple the teenagers, and they just, it just is a community of discipleship. So in India and other countries, community is how they disciple. Um, and that's how disciples are made in almost every other country except European or American countries. We're one of the only countries where we don't make disciples in community, but divide everybody up into little age groups, and it's just not biblical. Um, the American church is modeled after worldly programs. We just have taken the world and put it in church and said, this is good. And it, instead of looking at what, how Jesus discipled, his disciples and followers, or even how the early church was formed. Okay, um, so my basis for this is biblical. I'm going to read to you guys 2 Timothy 3, 10, and then I'm going to, in part of 11, then I'm going to skip down to 14. Okay. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose is. And life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and, you, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All right. Everyone, you guys have all heard the saying, do as I say, not as I do. Right? Everybody heard that? Has that ever worked out for anybody? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Even in, we see it like in poverty, but we also, generation after generation, we see it in addiction and alcohol and drugs, eating habits, and everybody can think of other things that I'm not saying. Um, But as a church, we have the opportunity to say, watch what I do, follow me to Jesus. This is what Paul is telling Timothy in these verses. You have known me, you have watched my life, because we have a relationship. You can follow my example. And you know the word so you can serve God well. Earlier in 1 Timothy, he tells Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to set an example in all these things he's, he's already set an example for him in. Um, this is how everyone learns. We teach our kids how to speak by talking to them. We teach our kids how... Uh, to read by showing them. You sit with a kid and you have to show them, this is why, this is how you do this. These are your rules. Um, and we learn basic life skills by example. We learn spiritual life skills also by example. We learn how to live like Jesus by example, which means we learn to be the church by example. If, we, if you come to a Wednesday night, you probably if you've been down there, it's kind of crazy, but if you stay a little while, this is what you'll see. Um, at some point, you'll hear me say, set an example to some of the older kids, or even the little kids. I, I say that to them. Sometimes you have to set an example for the older kids. Um, or you'll hear me say, you're not being a good example. Um, and then you'll also see mixed ages at most of the table, younger kids sitting with older kids and vice versa. You'll see Becca and I teaching them and how to read the Bible and apply it to their lives. And you'll see kids building relationships with us and each other. And recently, it's taken a little while, but you'll see some of the older kids leading tables. So we have, right now we have four groups of tables. And there will be a kid who will sit at a table and they'll guide them through the SOAP method, um, which is scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Most of you, I think, have done that. Um, And this is why we disciple our youth. In community, they're learning to be a mature disciple who can make disciples. They're learning to be a church who follows Jesus' example. Amen. You've all heard that statistic that it's roughly uh, somewhere between 75 and 86 percent of kids 
uh, will graduate high school and leave church. You've heard that statistic, right? It's a terrible statistic. This is, um, uh, despite what other churches may be doing, I, I don't know if they're trying to curb this statistic in any other way, but this is the specific uh, intergenerational technique that we believe is going to be the answer to reversing the statistic of 86% of children leaving church after their uh, um, they're 18 years old, and we believe God. We're gonna, we don't know if it's the answer, but we believe that it is the answer. The Lord has led us into this direction, and I can't tell you how Jennifer and Becca, they're doing a phenomenal job uh, at doing this very work, and I believe we're going to see... We're going to see children's lives preserved and changed, and they're going to walk in the ways of the Lord all the days of their life. There's no no just gaps in between there. Amen. Mark Smither is coming. He is a longtime board member of this church or elder of this church, and he is going to tell us why we have a board of elders. Because we're the dumb ones. (laughs) Not really. First things first. Boys. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to use the term deacon as opposed to elders because as I was looking this up in, in the brief time that, that I had the last couple of days, I found that um, elder is more a, a term for pastor, overseer, and a, a deacon is more a term for the servant. So I'm going to uh, re- re- relate to it in terms of why do we have a board of deacons? And... Um, if we look back in Scripture, we can go to uh, Acts chapter 6, and we can see that the, the, that the first deacons were put in place. They didn't necessarily call them that at that time, but the first deacons were put in place. And it says that, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repu- uh, repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we, may, uh, whom we will appoint to this duty. So we see that um, as, the, as the disciples, the twelve, were about their daily business, they were becoming overwhelmed with the daily business of the church that was being set up. And therefore they, they in their wisdom, called the church together and says, Now give us some names. Of, of men, and this is this is the basic qualifications of these men. And uh, the story goes on, and we, we see that the first martyr in the church was a deacon. Okay, but he didn't just serve tables; he served the community through sharing the word of God, through serving tables, through meeting the needs of the people. So much so that that uh, the Church of the day, they they were they were incensed by it, and and um, ultimately it led to his death. You know. And then Paul goes on in First Timothy, and he expounds a little bit more of the qualifications of a of a um, of who an um, a deacon would be in, in his uh, letter to Timothy in in First Timothy. And it says, deacons likewise must be dignified. Now, he, he was setting, leading up to this, Paul was setting, basically setting the church in order. There were, there were a leadership, a pecking order or a leadership, the elder or overseer or pastor, and then next was the deacons. And these were the two offices of the church at that time. And, and so um, Paul goes on and it says, 1 Timothy 3.8, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy or, or for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of faith with clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Verse 12, Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who will serve as deacons gain good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. The deacons are those within, from within the church body. Now, we don't call somebody off the street and say, come in and you be a servant, you be a deacon. They're from within the church body. You, you look at them each, each uh, season when we have a business meeting, typically we will elect a new board member. 
Um, and the names are provided from within the body, within the biblical standards set up in, in, in Acts 6. And um, they're provided to the existing board. And then of those names, the board will look at the qualifications and um, set an order for the body to elect that replacement deacon, that replacement board member. And so our, 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 our job, so to speak, is to be a servant to the body. Now, first, you know, we're prayer warriors. We're called to be prayer warriors. Pray over you. Pray over the ministry of the church. Pray over our pastor. Pray over each other. That's first and foremost, prayer warriors. And then we, we come alongside, we support our pastor in his endeavors to, to share the gospel. But we also come alongside aside, beside him, as we saw with Stephen, and share with our community the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, then, you know, one of our other responsibilities, as um, Sister Becker alluded to, you know, in, in the receiving of the tithes and offerings, receiving of the tithes and offerings, okay, we don't take anything except some guff every now and then. But how those tithes and offerings are, are distributed, you know, um, one of the scriptures says not the, he, the, the deacon shall not be one that is uh, uh, in support of filthy lucre or, you know, gains. Uh, you know, we take very seriously, you know, where those monies are distributed. Okay. We, you know, we look at do we really want to go this direction or do we really want to go that direction? Well, if there's no consensus, we pray. And, and, and come together with a consensus of, yes, this is a good option. Pastor alluded to earlier that, um, you know, we were this close to supporting all the Kentucky missionaries. Okay. And that was a vision that he had prior to coming to this church, you know, for this church, was that he would he would be in a church that would, support missions and support them in, in strong ways. Well, even prior to him coming, the board of this church had a vision to support the missionaries of Kentucky and, and to increase the support of those missionaries. So, you know, we as a board, we want to support our pastor's vision. He, you know, God, the, the, God gives the leadership of the church a vision for that body. And um, the thing about it is, it's not just the pastor that will have that vision. He might share, he might have the initial um, um, concept of it and share it with us. But we as the board, we come alongside and we, we seek God's guidance on it. And, and we, we um, ask him to open our eyes as well. And it, it, it's absolutely amazing, you know, sometimes when we sit down and talk and discuss the vision of the church. and It's just like that one with the... With the uh, the support of the missionaries, you know, Pastor had this this because he's got a heart for missions. He had this this desire and longing and vision of of being in a church that would would support every missionary from the district that he's in. And and he comes to a church, and lo and behold, this church has this same vision to to support the. That's why God is. You know, He will not. He will not give our pastor a, a, a vision and then none of the boards. Has, no, that's not okay. He won't do that. But he will He will give that if they spend the time in, in prayer and, and uh, seeking the Lord for that vision. Another thing that is a responsibility, as, as I, I said, I was sharing earlier, um, you know, the, the finances of the church. When... When the, the, the group uh, that called themselves New Harvest Assembly of God 
were praying for a, a, a building, a permanent home, because they were leasing a, a, um, a storefront right down the road here. And, and when they were praying, and Mark wasn't a part of it, so I'm, I'm but, but was close friends, relatives, so to speak, in, in, in Christ with, uh, with the brothers and sisters of, of the body at that time. And when they were, they were praying, and, and God gave them a vision of a building and, and they looked at one and and you know it wasn't God in that one and uh, this piece of property came and it was well beyond the means of the church at that time okay which meant that they were going to have to seek a mortgage to to purchase the property but God was in it God this was where God wanted they, they prayed and they prayed and a group of individuals as a group of individuals, but also as a corporate body. And, and this was the same place that they kept being led to and led to and led to. And so, you know, it is the responsibility of the, of the, of the board to, to seek the financial uh, means for a purchase like that and, and you know, go to the bank and, and set it up and then sign on the dotted line and say, you know, we as – as the body, as, as this, we're going to be responsible for this. And then, you know, whenever the time comes, when the bill comes due, to see that that bill is paid. And, um, you know, there's churches out there that that have, they, they only see the moment, and then when the bill comes due, they say, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And they're led by a poor board, I'm here to say. I mean, there, there's a... You know, we see opportunities come and we jump on them, all right? But by the same token, we consider, you know, what are our obligations and responsibilities. And we've got a great board right now. You know, when Pastor gave, this, gave me this assignment, he, he said, what is, you know, why a board of elders? And I got to thinking about Jennifer, and she would just be, she doesn't want to be called an elder. <laughs> Physical responsibility, you know, to the body, and, and to see that, you know, when we the doors will open next Sunday, and the following Sunday, and the following Sunday, and the, when you do give your tithes and offerings, when it is received into the body, we have a responsibility, not only to you but also to Christ Jesus, most especially to Christ Jesus, to see that those tithes and offerings are distributed in a way that you would be confident the next next Sunday to give those tithes and offerings again, knowing that they're going to the work of Christ. Okay. Um, last but not least, I want to say, and I'm sorry, my, my time's up. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Thank you, Mark. I want to talk to you about the last few minutes here about why the church, why pastoring, and why preaching. And the way that I want to do this is I want to get you excited for Wacky Wednesday. I'm trying to do everything in my possibility or ability to make Wacky Wednesdays a great success. So this theme of this Wacky Wednesdays is why uh, is a uh, um, Wacky Science Wednesdays, if you've seen the sign outside. And so we're going to talk about science. We're going to do science experiments and things like that every Wednesday night. It's going to be a lot of fun. So this morning, it makes a perfect application. If you're asking why, the the basis of an idea of a science experiment is, well, why does this happen? Why does this work? And so I'm going to use that in application, some of them simple, some of them a little bit more complex. So scripturally, I think that we can answer all three of these questions, why the church, why pastoring, and why preaching, based in this scripture, 1 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. And IV says this, Paul says to Timothy, the pastor in Ephesus, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Beyond all question, now it begins basically saying the gospel, the mystery for which true godliness is great. He appeared in the flesh, 
was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, and was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. So the basis of why the church exists, I think, can be shown simply in this. Let's do a little uh, a science experiment, if you will. Everybody take your hands, fold them in like this. You guys remember doing this when you were a kid, right? Here's the church. Everybody do that? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Everybody put your steeple up. Open the doors. And there's all the people, right? There's all the people. And you show, by simple illustration, this intertwining that happens within a church body. And so what we see the church becoming with this kind of simple illustration is is that uh, people are so intertwined in their lives, it starts to look more like family than it does just an organization or a a building or a bunch of people meeting together. And the beauty of it is that if you take your hands and you start to try to pull them apart, you know, bind them together and you pull them apart, it's a strong uh, binding that you have because... You can't pull it apart because our lives are so intertwined with one another's. So as part of this, in some ways, Michaela is going to be 11 years old. Everybody say happy birthday, Michaela. She's 11 years old today. Yesterday was Elias' birthday. I don't know where Elias is. He's somewhere around here. He's right there. There he is. Elias' birthday was yesterday. This stuff's significant because it's our family that we're celebrating together, right? It's our family. I think there's one other beautiful theological point in here that we need to make, and it's this. It's that when we come together, that this is a, if you will, a dress rehearsal for the end of time. Okay? So basically you come and you listen to me or or us preach and worship and things like that. But one day you will not gather together and just look at me. One day you will gather together and we'll be 360 degrees uh, surrounded around Jesus Christ as we are gathered together with him in the skies. So all this is, is a dress rehearsal for the end of time. And it's a powerful experience of what we will experience at the very end. Redwoods, if you think about the redwood, the great redwood forest in California, remember that intertwining that happens. And what happens is, is in the redwood forest, they don't have deep roots, but rather the roots spread out far and wide and they intertwine with one another. And that's what makes them strong in the tallest trees in all the world. It's because they're intertwined together and can withstand storms and trials and everything else that may happen in life. So why pastoring? Why why is the scripture saying in Ephesians 5 that we need a shepherd or a pastor? What's the point that those terms are synonymous in scripture? Why a shepherd? Why, why, Why do you need somebody like me? Why do you need to elect a pastor and have him come serve and preach and, and visit people and uh, disciple people? What's the point in all that? Why do we need somebody to pray for and, and look after? Well, 1 Peter 2.25 says this, For you were all like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. I'm speaking specifically about Jesus Christ as the shepherd and the overseer of your your souls. But it's used, that terminology is used the same way for a pastor, a shepherd, somebody that leads us together. Somebody that that is that intergenerational example so that we know where we're going. And this is that idea. Um, I've seen this time and time again. I learned this in Florida and I've, I've used it and practiced it here. Visitation of the sick of the shut-ins, of of those who are unhealthy or going through a time of sickness or whatnot, and praying with them. That's exactly what Jesus would do. And it changes and it transforms people's lives because they have a pastor who cares about them enough to go visit them. Now keep in mind that I may miss you or I may, there's also always times that I'm going to mess up or fall short of that. But let me tell you, I love people, I love you guys, I love our church, and I will visit you, and I will pray for you, and I seek God for you. Because I want to mirror the relationship that I have with the great shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd, he's the great shepherd. And if he's doing that for me, then I want to do it for you, and mirror that same relationship. And so I think we can show this. I want to do a science experiment now. Um... This is a a box of noodles here I have, and uh, this is a gallon of water. Come here, I need need some help, Wesley. Come here. I got a box of noodles, 
And see, this is part of the issue of the church and good shepherding is, is there's a certain order to things, right? And God wants us together, bound together. Wesley, come here. Hold this noodle on the end of each side. Hold the noodle, okay? Now, you got all this weight and tension in life and the heaviness uh, that life brings with it. And it's not, it's not easy to do this alone. Nope. Yeah, I told you it was heavy. And if you're alone, actually open one side. Yep. Put the noodle through. All right, Wesley. Oh, I didn't even get through it. Here, let's try it again. Hold that end. Hold that in. Wesley, you think this is going to hold that gallon of water? No? It's going to snap. Oh, man. <laughs> My brother-in-law, who's a, he, was, he told me, he's like, something's going to go wrong, Scott. <laughs> I was talking to him extensively about this. Do we have another gallon? Of, or is there another big uh, bottle of something in the fridge probably? Come here, Wesley. Give me a bigger kid. Or here, never mind, he's back. All right. Now here we all are in order. The church bound together, right? In one body in, within, within each other. Here, now hold this, Wesley. Hopefully we're going to get another bottle here real quick. Turn around so everybody can see you. Yeah, give me the milk. Milk's heavier than water. We'll see if this goes wrong. May the 14th, so wait for the smell. Uh, all right, if we're all bound together, Wesley, come over here, Wesley. Turn around. <laughs> Hold the ends of it. All right. Wesley, you think this is going to hold? Is this going to hold? Are you sure? There we go. Good job, buddy. Why does that hold? Why does it hold and the only one doesn't hold? Okay. Well, let me explain that to you. You can sit down. Good job. <laughs> The reason is, is because there's a tension on that because of the weight that's forced upon it, right? As far as the whole physics go, obviously any building that's engineered, there has to be trusses involved that are able to support the weight of the roof above it. And so the idea is, is that if your life is to be supported, if your life is to be together, we need one another. We need somebody to help us to make us strong together. Not apart, not separate. It's great to be strong and self-sufficient, at least in the Western context. Everywhere else in the world, they depend on each other. And that's what the church is. is this microcosm of a beautiful a relationship with one another in which we are strong, bound together, and strong like God wants us to be strong. So the last thing I want to talk about is why preaching. Why do we proclaim the truth? And I think that's beautifully illustrated by uh, uh, Paul here. And he says that the church is the pillar and the foundation of truth. It's not just the support of truth. It's not what holds up truth. But it's actually the foundation that supports the pillar of truth itself. It's the pillar and the foundation of truth. This is the responsibility of the church. So we preach the truth to one another. And we preach the truth to our culture over and over again. So maybe you've heard this in our uh, uh, recent culture. Uh, there's this big debate of Laurel versus Yanni. Who's heard of it? Anybody heard of it? Laurel versus Yanni. Okay. And all it is is this audio recording. And we're going to do it in just a second. I'm going to see what you hear. Laurel versus Yanni. It's an experiment. Okay. And it's going to play in the actual recording. Can you go ahead and play that now several times in the middle? Yeah. Is that in the middle? Yep. Okay, stop it. Everybody that hears the word Laurel, raise your hand. Who hears Laurel? Who hears the word Yanni? I actually heard Yanni that time. I don't really hear Laurel. All right, now stretch it 
to the to um, emphasize the higher uh, parts of the particular word. Okay, stop it. Now, what do you guys hear? Everybody hear Yanny? Nobody hear Laurel? You guys are anomalies, though. I... <laughs> All right, stretch it to the other side to emphasize only the lower part. Laurel. 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 Did you hear it? Laurel. All right, stop. Now, what do you guys hear that time? Laurel, right? Now, this is the issue. What's happening there is we stretched it from one side to the other is, is that some people hear uh, the yanny because they're listening. Their ears are hearing the higher end of the spectrum of the recording. However, the other side, those that hear Laurel are hearing the lower end of the spectrum of the tones. But the truth is this, that that word, does anybody know what the actual word is? The word is laurel. There's no dispute about that. The word is actually laurel. It was recorded from dictionary.com of the word laurel, the pronunciation. There's no dispute. But what happens in the world is this. They'll say something like, we just need to love one another. We just need to accept one another. But is that what God's really saying? Is that exactly what the scripture says? This is the truth is, is that. The word is laurel, and the church needs to be the community that is constantly speaking the truth, even when the world wants to hear something else. Constantly saying, this is truth, this is truth. Doesn't matter what the culture is saying, doesn't matter what the culture wants to hear. We need to be the ones that are standing the, as the pillars and the foundation of truth to tell the world what it's all about. And I think that this can be perfectly well understood in this, is is that I can preach a hundred times and people can hear whatever they want to. But what matters is, is that the truth is being given. And we stand as the pillar and the foundation of truth. And Christianity sets itself apart from the world in every other way in this. This is the beauty of Christianity. That they, other world religions serve a man who came, who lived, and then died. But Christians serve a man who came, he lived, he died, he rose from the dead, and then he ascended to heaven and said, I'm going to return for you. We serve a living God, not somebody who lived and died. So this is the beauty, I believe, of why we preach, why we pastor, why we are the church.